And this general officer just looks at me, he's like super seriously. And he just said, he's like, do you want to go to ranger school? And I was like, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> he's like, and he just looked at me again. He's like, you're going to ranger school. Welcome to The Grit Factor. Reimagining grit as part of the whole person in a life that matters. I'm your host, Shannon Huffman Polson. This season is brought to you by Tiller, the first personal finance service to automate all your daily spending and account balances into spreadsheets. So you can track everything in one place with everything customizable, strict privacy, and no ads. Try Tiller free today at tillerhq.com. Also by the Grit Institute, providing whole leader learning journeys in grit and resilience, purpose and storytelling. Invest in your people for long-term success. Find out more at thegritinstitute.com. A new class of Army Rangers is celebrating graduation today, and for the first time, two women are among the ranks. Two female soldiers have completed the Army's Ranger School, a grueling test of mind and body. Only the toughest survive. What we went through after we graduated Ranger School, which was a lot of backlash from some of the veteran community, I think, online. You know, yes. most of it most of it was online, I would say, but it gets back to you, and you hear people repeating it, and you hear people talking about it. You know, people doubting whether or not, uh, actually asserting that they must have lowered the standards. But cracks like, what standards were lowered? Did they only have to do one pull-up? Then they know for a fact yes. that, like, our rucksacks were carried by somebody else. And you just, you know, witnessing people, like, printing lies about you and just writing right. it like it's fact and spreading rumors, it just made me realize, like, you know, I, I actually exist, like, completely independent of, like, what people say about me. You know, I know what I went through and I know how that changed me. And like, nothing's going to affect that. You can't take that away from me. Completely changed who I am going through that four months of ranger school and the train up leading to it. The U.S. Army's Elite Ranger School was established in 1950. The format includes three phases. One at the Infantry Center in Fort Benning, Georgia. The Mountain Phase in Dahlonega, Georgia. And the Swamp Phase conducted in Florida. Training averages 19.6 hours a day. The recycle and failure rate is high. The school has been, as the infantry branch of the Army, exclusively and proudly male. Training is intended to stress participants up to the point of death, and candidates have died during this arduous training. Graduation rates fluctuate around 50%. In 2015, the first two women graduated from the challenging course— Captain Shea Haver and Captain Kristen Greist, to loud and frequently profane objection from service members both active duty and retired. Both were West Pointers, but their backgrounds were very different. Those of you who have read The Grit Factor have been introduced already to Haver, who came from a military family. Her dad was an Apache pilot, and she branched aviation and became an Apache pilot herself. Greist's background was not military. She came from a patriotic family in Connecticut. She was 12 when the airplanes hit the Twin Towers, and knew from that point on she wanted to serve. But she always wanted to be in the infantry. I've had the chance to meet and talk with Shea Haver several times in the last few years, but wanted to get the two together to understand what was similar and what was different in their approaches to a challenge most people can't begin to imagine. Well, Shay and Chris, it's great to see you on here and great to have you both on The Grip Factor. Thanks for joining. Thank you for bringing us on. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks. <laughs> Wonderful to have both of you here because you've shared so many experiences, but obviously come at it from your own unique perspectives as well. And I wonder if each of you would be willing to share about your experiences that led you to putting on a uniform in the first place. Sure. Uh, yeah, I could start. Um, So I think, you know, growing up, I was always interested in the army, uh, but I didn't come from a military family. I'm from Connecticut. Uh, So I was really Uh more from watching movies with my brother, uh, hearing about stuff from my dad uh, about history. Um, And then 9-11 happened when I was 12. Um, So that really, I would say, was probably the most motivating factor. I knew I wanted to join, but uh, I was, you know, 
six years away from being 18. So I didn't know how realistic that was. And then, you know, around 2006, 2007, uh, kind of the backdrop of my teenage years, you know, there was all the controversy with the wars, um, right. sending soldiers over for years or, you know, a year at a time and then extending it, coming home and going right back over there. So I felt like a very strong desire to help relieve some of that burden, sure. um, especially since I had gotten so much from America. You know, I do have a very patriotic family, so I felt a very strong need to give back and just contribute. Um, but I was really only interested in the infantry. It was all I knew um, about sure. the army. And it seemed like uh, the forces that needed relief the most, I guess. So I knew I couldn't join the infantry. And that kind of led me to West Point because um, I knew that cadets out of West Point have a pretty high percentage of getting their branch of choice. And I was hoping within four years, maybe the policy would change and I'd be able to go infantry um, awesome. Yeah. Kind of long story, but <laughs> so let me know. That's great from Connecticut to, uh, to the infantry. That's fantastic. <laughs> and Shay, you have a little bit of a different background, I think, right? I do. Yeah. So I grew up in the army, uh, to be quite literal. It's all I know. Um, I grew up as an army brat and started out, uh, actually I was born at Fort Huachuca, uh, Arizona. My parents met when my dad was a private there, um, actually in the army band. So little known fact because. He wow. Came, yeah. He became a, you know, a very, um, known and, and really wonderful pilot, um, which I ended up following in his footsteps, but, um, I grew up all around military posts and the military community was my family. And, um, I really enjoyed growing up on posts and, and around military families, seeing soldiers everywhere, uh, you know, my growing up years, having helicopters around all of the time, like it was something that very much um, was part of me and my life. I knew that in some, some capacity I wanted to serve. I didn't know in what branch or in what way. Um, I think I started out when I was a kid, kind of that uh, dream, like I really wanted to help people. And I thought the best way you could do that was be, by being a doctor. So I was like, okay, where, you know, where can I find, you know, the means and the money to go to school to be a doctor. <laughs> Um, and so as I got older, um, I, I tried to start looking for those ways and found out about the military academies because I was part of junior ROTC in high school. So that was an right. army ROTC program that I absolutely loved. Uh, my whole life growing up, it was always part of like team sports, soccer mostly. Um, and then JROTC, which really um, both really solidified for me, like this idea of like teamwork community um, that I, that I really, I think that have carried with me forward. But um, all also led to uh, determining where I would go to school and how I would enter the military. So having great conversations with right. dad early on in, in high school about how do you pay for uh, med school um, led to, well, you go <laughs> to the military academy, that's how. So um, I applied to the Air Force Academy um, and I also applied to West Point and um, probably ignorantly decided that I didn't want to be on a five-year program. I got accepted to the Air Force Academy, but to the prep school up front. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh. Yep. But I got accepted as a direct admin to West Point. So I was like, they must not care that I'm not that smart. So <laughs> I was like, grit matters. So I was like, <laughs> so I was like all right, I'm going to join the army. Um, and I decided to go that route. And um, lo and behold, I never became a doctor. So I don't know if that's, you know, ever going to be in the cards for me, but I think that I've found a pretty awesome path that despite, you know, not following that initial dream that's led me to all kinds of other dreams on, you know, unrealized, but, um, but wonderful. But now, yeah. So Chris, were you an athlete as well in high school? Um, I was, I was, yes, but I was really more athletic, I think, when I was a kid. And then I kind of struggled in high school to find my groove. I bounced around from uh, softball, basketball, volleyball. Um, I got cut from the basketball team. I didn't really fit on the volleyball team. Um, but then my junior year, I found my best friend brought me to cross country practice and I thought it sounded crazy. I was like, why would you ever run for fun? Like, that doesn't make <laughs> sense. Um, and she was like, come on, just come with me. It'll be fun. And then I actually, I loved it and, um, stuck with that. So I did track year round for my junior and senior year. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. And then you both ended up at West Point in the same class. Different uh, classes, actually. So oh, different love, classes. I would love to talk about this actually, because this is really fun. So Kristen, sorry, you're, <laughs> she's <laughs> a year ahead of me in 2011. 
grad, 2012 uh, grad. And actually, okay. before Kristen and I ever met each other, I knew of Kristen Grice and like she mm-hmm. was my hero. Um, she just had like a great reputation for being just um, really strong militarily, like very focused, like very, it was very intent on going into the infantry. Um, and she was our, um, our one of our so- summer program sergeant majors. And I got to be underneath of her as just like a normal Uh, like, you know, like lower level leader. Um, And I just remember watching her work with the other cadets and then with the other leaders and just being really impressed um, by the way that she handled herself, how she handled other people. And it wasn't until like later in the school year um, after that summer that we had, we had worked together. She did not know who I was. I knew who she was. (laughs) Actually, I did know who she was. (laughs) Well, okay. Fair enough. But I remember coming up to her and being like, so, you know, fangirling around. I was like, um, excuse me, Kristen Grist. Um, I just wanted to say, I really think you're amazing. And <laughs> I want to follow in your footsteps. Come to find out we end up becoming very close friends and get to go on some of the very, you know, same journeys together, which has been so awesome to have a friend and someone that you look up to, to go through that with. Oh, well, thank you. But yeah, so Shay didn't know this at the time. But um, my friend Pete was her, he was my classmate and I think he was your platoon leader Mm -hmm. um, that summer detail. And when I was just talking to him, he was like, oh yeah, well, this is going to be easy for me because I got this cadet Shay Haver and she is like intense. And uh, (laughs) (laughs) he was like, she's just going to take care of everything. I don't think I need to do any work. And I was like, I was like, oh, okay. And I, so I remember hearing about Shay too. So I just thought that was so funny. And by complete coincidence, we ended up shaving our heads together the night before Ranger School. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was just a total coincidence that we ended up both graduating together. That's fantastic. So yeah, so how did, and I know there's a whole West Point journey, but let's get into that Ranger School part. How did you end up both both going that route? What, how did the opportunity open up and what made you decide to pursue it? Uh, So I had been looking out for this for my whole, time at West Point, I would tell anybody who would listen, I want to go to ranger school and I want to join the infantry. And they were just like, um, that's not a thing, you know, for women. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, I did have a couple mentors that were awesome along the way. So they started me early, like pushing me to train just harder than I ever expected that I could. Um, they were like, Hey, here's the ranger standard, just train for it and be prepared to go because the doors are going to open up eventually. Um, I feel like a great Colonel Herder's accent on there. <laughs> um, but so these are West Point teachers or or faculty that are helping right, they you. Were, uh, one was a teacher. One was my uh, regimental TAC officer or one of the okay. RTOs. Great. Uh, so anyway, four years later, um, after I came back from Afghanistan in 2013, the I was I was not sure if I was going to stay in the army. I was in the military right. police and I loved it, but. I didn't know if infantry was going to ever open up. And then I heard rumors that ranger school was going to open up. Um, and, you know, pretty much from 2014 till uh, I went to a pre-ranger class, it was like April to October of 2014. I just tried to train as hard as I could. Um, and then they, they, they made the announcement that September that we're going to allow some women to come to a pre-ranger class at Fort Benning. We'll do four waves of that. Uh, I think it was 40 women per class. And they said from those women, if whoever passes that pre-ranger course, they'll get to go to ranger school in April, 2015. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. And then I first had to pass the ranger pre-ranger class at Fort Campbell, the 101st Airborne Division, which I had to do twice. So. Wow. (laughs) And what, what was that like? Uh, it was so, it, it was exciting, but it was really nerve wracking. Cause I knew I was like, this is, I want to do this my whole life. Don't screw it up. And of course I did. Cause I went to the first pre-ranger course and, uh, my boss at the time was super supportive and he was like, yep, it's a two day thing. Go do it. Uh, let me take off work. And I came back and I failed and I was like, so dejected cause I failed land navigation, which I had not failed before. It was just really embarrassing. But, um, you know, he was like, Hey, that's fine. Just go the next month. They do it every month. You know, the men do it. Um, just, you know, brush up on that and, uh, go tackle it again. So, uh, I spent like that whole month of November in the woods by myself, like doing land navigation. 
And then I went back to the course in December and uh, was actually the honor graduate at that time. So I was very, I felt much more confident in my ability and then went down to Fort Benning in January of 2015. That's fabulous. And Shay, yours was a slightly different track because instead of being an MP, you were, you were an Apache pilot, right? Yeah, I'd say it's different in a lot of ways too. So I absolutely had zero desire to go to ranger school. (laughs) (laughs) I remember reading the same message uh, that Kristen um, is talking about and literally my thought, and I said it out loud to myself, I was like, bad ass, like, go, like, good for those girls, like, awesome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and like, I, I don't know, I, I, it wasn't because um, I didn't think that I didn't want to do it um, or that I wasn't capable of it. I didn't really put much thought into it because I was so focused on what I was doing. I had just trained for a year and a half to be an Apache pilot. Um, I had right. gotten what I had thought was my dream job. Um, I was so happy, like learning and being challenged every single day. I was right in the middle of gunnery really, um, when this became, like came up on my, um, radar. So it was something like I was intently studying for and training for. Um, and, uh, actually I had the, um, the honor, uh, my platoon was selected from my battalion commander to, um, like represent our battalion and our new deputy commander for the division has coming in and kind of just getting to know the force. Um, and, he wanted to get to a ride in an Apache helicopter. So my platoon was selected yeah, to do that. And I was like, okay, I guess, I guess general officers can fly whatever they want. That's awesome. <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, yeah. So, so I was out with my platoon, you know, prepping the aircraft and making sure that we were, we were good and we were leading, getting ready to go into gunnery. So like that was my focus, um, heavy into maintenance and, and making sure everything was good to go. Um, and I was out on the flight line when my battalion commander uh, brought um, our deputy commander out um, to see the aircraft. And my battalion commander, just like any good leader, you know, does kind of embarrassing me and like, you know, like, oh, this is Jay Haver. She's super fit. She, you know, gives the guys a run for her money. She's a great platoon leader. Um, getting ready to go into gunnery, all these things. And this general officer just looks at me, he's like super seriously. And he just said, he's like, do you want to go to ranger school? And I was like, eh, uh, <laughs> no, no, I don't, no. <laughs> he's like, and he just looked at me again. He's like, you're going to ranger school. And I was like, whoa, okay. Uh, like left that one, kind of laughed it off, whatever. Um, you know, he goes, wow. does, does his flight. Uh, comes back. My battalion commander sees me like a, a day or two later. He's like, you know, he wasn't joking, right? And he's like, they're the the division is doing like a an OML like process, and they're running just like what Kristen just just described. The 101st was doing, but Fourth uh, Infantry Division was doing um, something similar um, out at Fort Carson um, and sending people to go do that. So he's like, so you're you're going in a couple of weeks. You tell me when you're you know you tell me when you're you're going. I was just like okay. I was not like expecting that at all. Um, so I had to, you know, I had to make the choice for myself. I wasn't going to just go in like personal pride, right. I'm not going to go and just like bomb it. So I'm like, I'm going to prepare. I'm going to do the best that I can go, you know, show up. So, um, I, I, I ended up, um, doing, doing well enough that, um, the division chose me to, to represent us and, and go with a very small cohort, um, of women and men that the fourth ID was sending. And that was a big deal for fourth ID because we're, we are a heavy organization and not a lot of, not a lot of tabs to go around. You know, it's not the expectation that a light infantry sure. unit has. And so like, it, it was a big deal. Like our, our class, our cohort, like we were kind of, we were all like kind of proud going to the pre, you know, pre-ranger at Fort Benning together. And, um, and going like as a small group. So, um, that was, that was my, that was my path, <laughs> not as, <laughs> not as deliberate as Kristen's at all. Um, but to get there, uh, and, and it, and it took, I mean, obviously it took, you know, a, a lot of physical effort, but also, um, a lot of mental preparation on my side too. So, um, maybe we'll get to, you know, more, more of that, um, as we talk, but that's, that's just the generic path as to how I got to that position. No, that's, I mean, that's amazing. And I do feel like that is really relevant is both the physical and the mental preparation. So I, I, I kind of want to jump right in, but let's also talk a little bit about that. What did each of you do to prepare yourselves to, to prepare mentally and to prepare physically? So, um, I think for me, I was mostly concerned about the physical preparation, um, You know, they, I talked to my friends as soon as this happened, I remember I was going down to a wedding in Florida with a friend and I was just grilling him on the plane. I was like, what is, what happens in ranger school? I was taking notes and he was telling me, um, you know, he was an infantry lieutenant. So he was like, 
you know, there's three phases, you know, this is what happens. This is how long they are. And I was just taking notes like, okay, like I, I'd always wanted to go to ranger school, but I'd only thought of like, you know, being in the woods in general tactics, physical stuff. I didn't know the details. Right. So I got all that. Um, and I actually tried to write an op order for how to integrate women into, <laughs> into ranger school. And I essentially wrote what they did, which was, I didn't realize pre-ranger courses were even a thing. And I was like, they should test us on these five events. They should put us in. And that's exactly what they had planned. <laughs> so my mentor, Oh, that's great. Yeah. He was like, Kristen, they already have it. Like, don't worry. They have a plan. <laughs> I was like, okay, I just want to make sure I don't get left out. <laughs> and, uh, so I started, uh, running marathons because I'd actually run my first marathon right before my first deployment to Afghanistan, because I wanted to go to ranger school for that, like mental gut check to, to give myself the assurance that I could push through something very challenging. And sure. since I couldn't go to ranger school, I was like, well, I'll, I'll try to run a marathon, which was terrible. Um, <laughs> I don't think I trained properly for it at all. Um, but it gave me that foundation where two years later I was like, okay, well, let me, let me start running marathons and let me actually try to get a little faster. And, um, so I think I did two that summer and then I did the army 10 miler. Um, so it was really like, I use running as mental training because every, you know, every time you want to quit and you don't, that is, right. that is like mental training, you know, for your mental toughness really and resiliency. It's Great. Um, and I just find long distance running to be the best way to do that. So that was my main effort. And then also simply, um, passing the, the physical events, you know, I started doing a lot of upper body workouts for the pushups and the pull-ups. I did a lot of ruck marching. Um, sure. and yeah, it was, it was really that mental training, I think was, was the, the key part for me. And so you were thinking of the physical though, as inherently tied to that mental piece as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And Shay, you were a triathlete and a soccer player and a power lifter and all of this already, right? Yeah. To, to a certain extent. Yes. I did a lot of, um, uh, I guess dabbling when I was in, in college at West point. Um, sure. I ended up not playing soccer at school and because it had been my life for so long, it was pretty, it was devastating. It was just like trying to find like where you fit. And, um, my, uh, my team leader at the time was on our, uh, at West point was on our cross country skiing team. First of all, I hate the cold. So I was like skiing just that I'm totally out. I was like, I'm definitely not going. <laughs> he was trying to help. Like, he's like, you know, like what, what else we can get you into something else, you know? And his roommate was on the triathlon team. I'd never even dreamed of doing something that like endurance, you know, heavy before. Um, so I went with him, his roommate. Um, to practice a couple of times because I promised my team leader I would give it a fair shot. You know, he got me out of my room and got me onto a team sport. So I was like, okay. Um, and I absolutely fell in love with it. So endurance sport in general became um, just kind of an outlet for me and something that I could really um, still be on a team, but really choose after some like very individual, like personal, hard, gritty things. And I just, I found a, a deep passion for that. I did that and I rock climbed. Uh, it was a lifetime wow. sport for me as one of the sport and I fell in love with that. And so I joined our, our rock climbing team for a period of time, um, which really gave me this awesome. So I had like this endurance training and they gave me a really awesome, like upper body strength that I had never really explored or developed very much because it wasn't really a focus and outdoor, sure. you know, Climbing was kind of, you know, like what everybody thought our team was a hippie thing to do. <laughs> and, you know, but for the sake of my teammates, like some of them sure would love to have been called hippies. The other ones just really wanted to be like outdoorsmen and which is awesome. Like, and I loved that group of guys and, and girls that I got to spend time with. So it was the endurance and that upper body strength and really like solving problems, being comfortable outside, being comfortable, being uncomfortable, um, that like those sure. two things together. And then my last two years, um, I also um, had other friends that I joined um, our strength training team um, with. So I had like this very, could not have planned it, um, weird triangle of, of like functional fitness that I, what we sure. come to kind of know um, that fueled like definitely not, you know, an expert in any one of them, but really enjoyed and was not bad at, you know, all of them. Um, right. Me a really good foundation and base. And I just learned how to 
intricately weave that into my daily physical uh, fitness routine um, throughout my time that I was uh, at flight school for a year and a half. And then when I was out in Colorado, so I got to still do endurance sports and climb and, and different things. It was, it was really fun. It was something I could do with people. So all of that awesome. really formed like this really specific base for me, like specifically the functional fitness piece um, right. that, 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 that gave me kind of, um, and again, a jack of all trades, but really like not specifically good at any one thing, um, w- which was super helpful. And I know a lot of people, when they ask me, what did you do to train for ranger school? Like, that's a really like horrible <laughs> thing for me to tell them because <laughs> that's not <laughs> specific at all. Did I run? Yep. I run. And I, I ran and I rocked. And, um, I guess more specifically, once I found, like, once I knew that I was going to be going to ranger school, I did, I spent a lot of time yeah. under, because I was really worried, um, about what everybody else in the army, I guess, and every, all men were worried about was like, Oh, the women are, they're going to break their hips, you know? So I was like, Oh yeah, we're going to break our hips. So I really <laughs> wanted to make sure my hips were strong. So I did. I Is that what they said? That you're going to break your hips? Right, Chris? Yeah. Yes, that was a big concern. Where did that come from? That that seems so random. It, it came from uh, women <laughs> and AIT and basic train training, really. But it but but the, here's the thing: it's a generational thing. That before okay. sports for women was such a more popular thing in early years, like early you know enlistees into the military had a really hard time. There were a lot of um, um, uh, injuries in general, like lower limb injuries, your knees, okay. ankles, um, shins, hips, all this stuff. So the data is out there and I understand why they thought that it was that way, but what they weren't taking into account was the Shea Havers and the Kristen Grice and the, all the other women out there who grew up playing sports and you right. know, they ended up be, like having a different body density and strength and starting point than yeah. women in other generations had. So sure. that's, that's really that's really important so not only you know for me it was the diversity of things but it was also like culturally acceptable for me and my generation and my peers to have been participant to sports and co-ed sports and you know and that's what we grew up with right Um, right right so so then you know getting ready for ranger school specifically I knew I was like okay well yeah they're worried about this their data says this then I'm gonna you know focus on um making sure that my my lower body um, stability is there. So I was really worried about like right. hip mobility and stability and then my upper body strength. I was just always worried that I was going to be the weakest link, not be able to like help carry the log or the pole or push something over my head just because I was smaller, I'm just sure. I'm literally smaller, you know? So, <laughs> um, so I really focused on those things as well. And probably I've never uh, like exposed like this to anybody before, but one of the things that I did do is, um, for confidence reasons, um, for physical fitness reasons, but I, um, I had a friend convince me to train for and compete in a, um, like a bodybuilding competition. And so oh, I did. Wow. Yeah. I've never really, I don't think I've ever really shared that with anybody, but, um, yeah. So like later in the, of the year of 2014, um, that was something that I just said, I was like, okay, I'm going to go for this. Cause there, there was like a lot of connotation around it. It's like being strong is weird and people, you know, like girls are looked at right. like, big or all these things and I was like you know what like these women are beautiful and they work really really hard and like the discipline that it takes like I want that I want to know what that's like and so I I I followed along with a friend who convinced me to do it with her and and we did it and and we trained and competed and did really well and it gave me so much confidence um really that I was I was lacking significantly (laughs) um in my physical preparation uh, just because I just assumed because everyone else thought, and I kind of thought too, I was like, no, there's no way, you know, that I can do these physical things. So it was, it was, it was good. It was all part of this indescribable plan that I couldn't have come up with on my own, you know, to, to, to find like this physical trifecta of preparing myself for um, what would be ranger school. Well, I love how you described that. And Chris, how you were describing too, like going back to the marathon and Shay coming up with this bodybuilding competition, because both of you have these incredible backgrounds that I think most people would assume that you would just naturally fit right into this, this ranger school challenge. And yet you really wanted to push yourself and develop that confidence by going out of your comfort zone, even though your comfort zone already was stretched beyond what most people would understand. Yeah. And I think, um, something I would like to point out is that I actually couldn't meet the Ranger, uh, standard before, um, this became like a potential reality. 
like the okay. Ranger physical fitness test was the pushups, setups and five mile run. And I, my whole time as a Lieutenant, I was trying to run five miles in 40 minutes. And even though I ran cross country in high school, it was never that far. And sure. it had been years since I'd done that. So, um, like that was always a struggle for me as a Lieutenant. And I never thought, I thought that was going to be my biggest hang up was the five mile run. And then when I realized that this could happen, you know, this could be re a reality. I started training so hard and like put in the effort and actually was consistent with it. And that became like my biggest strength. I like, I finished, I remember it was like, I think it was 32 54, you know, like fantastic. That number, the run, she crushed the run. <laughs> and I, never, wow. and I couldn't run under 40 minutes for so long. And I came in first in that, um, pre-ranger class. Of course, then I failed to land nav, but, um, <laughs> cause I was so focused on the physical piece. Um, but it was just like that, you know, being able to see my success from not being able to get under 40 minutes for like five years. Uh, sure. and then all of a sudden that concentrated effort making me so much, so much more successful in that event. As soon as I failed the land nav, I was like, okay, well, same thing. Like, let me just go in the woods and concentrate on this. And I think I actually can improve if I actually focus on it. Whereas when I was younger, if I wasn't naturally good at something, I was kind of like, oh, this is stupid. <laughs> or like, sure. I would have was like, oh, this isn't for me. But when it was something I really wanted, I was like, okay, I'm not naturally good at this. I need to get a plan and train for it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I kinda, that's excellent. Yeah, I kind of want to capitalize on that too, Chris, that like, um, especially even now, uh, I, I think that people really look at, especially, especially ranger school, but a lot of things in life, they're like, oh, it's, it's a physical challenge um, that's going to get you and you, oh, you prepare and you prepare and, and you need to, um, absolutely. But I think that you get, you, some people think that that's all that it is. And it's this, this physical preparation. Um, what I hope everyone's hearing and you're hearing too, is that even in our physical preparation, we knew it was a mental thing too. Um, and then there were some, probably some very specific, um, deliberate uh, mental things that we did um, to prepare as well. And um, I, I don't, you know, I don't mind like sharing mine um, up front and by saying um, sure. I was really fortunate. Um, the, the military was doing um, a really great job, especially around that time. Um, trying to incorporate, um, it was called the Comprehensive um, Soldier and Family Fitness at the time. It's now called the Ready and Resilience uh, Performance Centers for Training, um, and they were they were trying, you know, they were at every or every division, every post, essentially, um, and they were trying to push like what this, you know, basically uh, resilience training and trying to get like this mental aspect of physical fitness and resiliency like in the military, and I think. A lot of people just saw it as like, oh, this is like suicide prevention or it's like soft science and it's not, you know, it's not something that's intentional or, you know, like it's going to help me. It's like, it's too foo foo. Like we don't want to, we don't want to do it. It's not hard enough, you know? Um, right. And, and during my um, training part, part of our pre-ranger training at Fort, fourth ID was bringing these, you know, this, these teams in and doing some of this training. I was like, Hmm, I remember kind of learning a little bit of this kind of stuff, like from the center of enhanced performance at West Point, like, you know, they would teach us some like study habits or like, you know, attention control skills or like memorization techniques or something like that. And um, I just remember it being kind of more like, okay, this is what you do in the moment or like after you fail a test, like, you know, control your breathing and your thinking and like get back on track. But this was the first time when they incorporated it into this ranger training that I realized it could be used as like a preventative, like pre, pre-crisis, rather real or perceived pre-crisis training. Right. And, um, and I was, I was intrigued. So like I, I did all the training, um, and like was, took it like really seriously. And I, and I, and I noticed over time, I was like, man, if I don't pass ranger school, it is not because I haven't physically prepared. Like something could obviously come up. Like it's no guarantee of success regardless. But I know that there's one thing that could absolutely prevent me from passing this school. And it is my mind, like me sabotaging, sabotaging myself with like my mind and like my feelings wow. of, you know, inadequacy or unworthiness to be there or whatever. And I was like, oh, this is bad. I need to talk to somebody about this now. You know, so I was like, I was like, all right, team. I, these are, this is where, this is where I'm at. This is how I feel. Like, what, do, what do I do to prepare for this? Like in the moment, I don't think that I will ever quit. I told them this, I was like, I don't feel like I'm ever going to like mentally break down or cry or like quit, you know, physically, like my leg's going to have to be broken for me to quote unquote quit. Right. But I was like, but I am afraid of like what my mind is going to prevent me from like accomplishing because like, I don't feel worthy to be there. 
Um, and so specifically, like we came up with like these three things, like it was really uh, so great. It was like a week out before I left. Um, and it was coming up with my why, like why I wanted to be there. Um, and then um, uh, visualize, like visualizing techniques, essentially, uh, visualizing success. And then um, we came up with a mantra, like when all else fails and you're completely exhausted, because let's be honest, like everything we know to be you know, like ranger schools, you're like, oh, like, we all know what to expect, like have something in your back pocket. And so I came right. up with, a, you know, a mantra. So my why and like, I, uh, I don't know, like, I know you said, like, we'll get, you know, we may have to do more, but um, it, it would go much deeper than this. But very simply, it became my why became like my soldiers and as an aviator, it became the ground soldiers that I knew that I would be supporting. Um, and then it became a ranger buddies. And then just knowing that like they deserved for me to be the best leader that I could possibly be. And if ranger school was the best leadership school that you could go to, that I deserved to be there because I was a leader and I needed to do my best. Like I needed to go as far as I could possibly go. So my why was like, I needed to be there for them. Like right. I needed um, and that, like that drove me like very, very far. Um, and then visualizing success was huge. So mm -hmm. believing that you're believing that you're, um, you deserve to be there and then also visualizing the success. Like I can't, like I had to put the two together. Like I, I deserve to be at this PT test right now. Right. And I deserve to get, you know, as many as my, like I'm visualizing myself doing these 49 push perfect push-ups and like I have to do them that way I want them to count I want to meet the standard I have to do them perfectly and I would visualize myself before each event one event at a time and it got exhausting you just have to focus on one thing at a time but visualizing what success looked like in that thing and it was it gave me the ability to control my energy and my attention in that moment and only exhaust what I need to like for for that event um right. and that became huge. And I carry that, you know, throughout ranger school and every single recycle and every single new thing, you know, and it's just like, okay, I can do that. I can do it again. Just focus, you know? Um, and that wow. became really important for me. And then the final thing was the mantra and it sounds so simple and silly, but really like at the end of the day, when you really are that, uh, kind of depleted, you know, of, um, motivation, uh, you kind of feel defeated like yourself and like from the instructors like there, I mean, it's, it's good. Oh man. It's so good to be at your rock bottom sometimes because you never know. You just never know. Like if you're not put into a training or a real life scenario that makes you be your best, like right. you just don't know. So like my, my mantra and those really tired, hungry, whatever, you know, moments, um, or when I would beat myself up was one so simple, but it just became one. And I would say to myself, uh, and to others, it's like one, you can always do one more of something, one more step, one more day, yeah. one more mission. Um, you can always do one more of anything. Um, and that, that became something that I held on to very tightly. So these, these mental skills that I thought I was like, man, I was like, all right, well, you know, it's kind of not hokey, but it's like, this is just like a last ditch effort to hold together became the thing. Like, because in the end, everyone gets tired. You can go in sure. big, beefy, strong, physically fit, and you can pass rack week. And that's about as far as like your physical fitness, like really will carry you. Like you obviously need to be able to walk and ruck the rest of all of the phases. But I will tell you that my assessment of myself was probably the best assessment that I could make that I probably never would have gotten as far and then completed the tasks. Um, if I would have never learned how to uh, like overcome my mind, um, in those moments. So, um, I'd say that's amazing. That, yeah. It's, I guess yeah. a testament to the mental toughness piece. Can we pause for one second? Um, only because I need to plug into a different plug. So I'm going to just um, ask you to stay put for just a minute and I will be right back with you. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm All right. Keep telling oh, we're good. Let Kristen or Chris uh, go ahead and respond to, uh, if you have other thoughts, but I love, I love that setup. That was just fantastic. Oh yeah. So I, that reminded me of a funny story about, uh, taking the, the fitness test at Ranger school. Um, you know, cause Shay was talking about how she was, you know, being nervous about it and then trying to visualize passing each event. Well, there is this kind of rumor about the Ranger physical fitness test that if, you know, they can only get so many people through the course and there's, you know, 500 or 300 people that show up. And if you're not at the front of the line 
and you're in the back of the line uh, to get your pushups counted, they might just not be very generous at all and might just start cutting pushups because they've already got too many people. And that's a okay. rumor. I have since been a ranger instructor and can tell you that's not true. Um, <laughs> I've been the one counting the pushups now, so that's actually not true. Um, I was like, what's I love that though, too. I love that you've been the one counting the pushups. That's great. Yes. But at the time as a student, I was like, I, I thought I really messed up because when they said like, all right, go get in line. I just was almost last in line. I was like third from the back or something. And I was just like, that's it. You know, I'm done. Like they're going to cut me. And then I looked over and I saw Shay was actually even further back than me. And just immediately I was like, Shay's not going to fail the pushups like period. Like I know that. So this must not be true. Like, and it just like immediately changed my mind from like, I failed, like I'm in the back and they're going to cut all my pushups to being like, wait a second. I know Shay is not going to fail the pushups. That's not reality. Like, so it can't, so it must be passable, even though I'm all the way back here. Um, oh, it just great. like, yeah. So I just thought of that. <laughs> It's <laughs> fantastic. So tell me, bring me into when you were shaping your heads together before ranger school, where were you? What did that feel like? How, what was the whole, uh, the whole vibe? That takes some mental toughness, Chris. You Absolutely. Can tell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it really wasn't that bad, but Chris, yeah, Chris, you can tell us about it. Well, I think what was more surprising and possibly traumatic was going down to the two week pre-ranger course, um, yeah. and finding out the night before that I had to cut my hair for that. And it wasn't, we actually weren't allowed to shave it because of the female hair standards, but it was, we had to cut it boy short, like, you know, one inch long. And, uh, I found out the night before, um, and I, cause I was in commandos buying my last minute stuff. And I saw a bunch of women with shaved heads and I was like, wow, are they just really intense about this? Or, and I asked Liz Hunter, <laughs> <laughs> cause I ran into her there and uh, she was like, yeah, we got to cut it. And so that was like, okay, I guess I'm cutting my hair, even though this is a two week thing that I could very well fail, you know, 25 women oh, showed wow. up to my course and only five of us passed, but wow, 25 of us basically shaved our heads. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then a couple of them went back and eventually got, uh, eventually passed and then were able to go to ranger school, thankfully. Okay. But wow. So then by no the preparation time, for that, yes. But then by the time Shay and I were shaving our heads, it was also pretty much the night before. And we cut it to like a quarter, quarter inch of hair was finally allowed for women. So where were you? Were you in a barracks? Were you in a BOQ bathroom? What were you doing? We were in the, um, they put us up for a few weeks right before the course started in the airborne barracks, just as like holdovers. Cause they were expecting to get about 70 women. Okay. Uh, for this April course. And then by the time March came, they had six and they were like, wow. okay, we need to make sure we actually have any women to conduct this course. So, you know, around March timeframe brought us down and consolidated us to make sure we didn't get injured, frankly, or, you know, go to the field or something and, and not be able to work out for a month. Okay. Um, so yeah, we were all down at Fort Benning for like a you know, a few weeks right before the course started. And we just went over to Victory Drive and went to the first barber we could find and had to shave our heads. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what were you feeling? What were you thinking? Uh, I think by that point I was committed to it, but I think sure. it's funny that when I was applying to military academies, I looked at the Naval Academy in the West Point and for the Naval Academy, it said women had to cut their hair to shoulder length. Okay. And I was like, nope, not doing it. <laughs> and I didn't even finish <laughs> looking at it. I was like 18 years old. I was like, no, nah, I'm not cutting my hair. And so then I just thought it was funny that by the time I was 26, I was like, all right, let's go. And I shaved my head again in mountain phase. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually. So I'm pretty sure Chris, if I think you, if you remember this too, our, like our so we recycled the first days of Ranger School three three times. We went through it three times, recycled twice. Um, wow. when, we, when we went into uh, our final chance of going through um, Derby phase, we shaved it all off. We went we went bald bald because we were like in in a sea of actual bald heads, and you sure. have a and you have a quarter inch of hair. It stands out, <laughs> and like even though it's still bald, it's not bald enough. 
So I was like, I, I'm done with that. Like we're, we're the, all the same. We're the same, same, or we're not at all. And like, it, it's going to be a testament to that there's, that there's just, there's differences. So like, that's, that's not going to be the point. So it's like, that's it. I'm, I'm shaving. If I get in trouble for, you know, it's called bicking using a big razor, like your head. Okay. If I'm going to get, you know, kicked out of ranger school for doing what literally the other 99% of the class is doing. And I think that's pretty messed up. So it's like, I'd rather get kicked out for the the literal reasons, right? The literal reasons um, that you sure. do at the ranger school. So um, I do remember that, but to, to Kristen's point, by the time we shaved our heads, like, that's it. Like we're, we're in it. We're bald until we're not, you know, we're bald. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. But there's something about that, right? I mean, that sounds like that was a decision that was moving you to even a greater form of commitment in a way. Is that fair? Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, think there was, I think it was definitely an acceptance. It was definitely an acceptance of like, this is, this is required. And like, I, I accept that this is part of the requirement and like, that's a really, in, in the big scheme of things, it's a really petty thing to choose to not like, you know, to let get in the way or stand in the way. Sure. Um, it may have deterred people. So I don't want that, you know, to be taken away from anybody that it did deter. Um, sure. But is a uh, six years worth of hair growth right here so <laughs> I kept you know finally um, look, looking like a long-haired girl <laughs> I think that uh also just the practicality of it like yeah once my hair got like an inch long again or like a half an inch I was like this is terrible there's like dirt in here and it was just gross and I remember in mountains I just all the dudes were lining up in the bathroom to you know one guy was shaving everybody's head and I just got in line because I was like yeah I need like this gotta go. Like <laughs> there's yes, sand right. in here and it's <laughs> uncomfortable. And then I kept my hair short as a company commander because, um, in the infantry, because, you know, going down to JRTC, you know, I, and my hair was like awkwardly growing out at this length. And I was like, I can't, I can't manage this. I'm in the field for a month. Like it's coming off again. And I pretty much didn't grow it out until after, uh, the expert infantryman badge training. Okay. And, I just, and then I let it grow. But it was just, I mean, it's so convenient. <laughs> it takes you right. five minutes to shower and get ready. <laughs> I may go back to it someday. That's, so you guys, I mean, there's so many different things that you have done that are inconceivable for, for anybody to, to imagine. If you had to pick one thing from Ranger School, um, and I'm sure you guys have discussed this many times on various places and opportunities, but that that was incredibly difficult, maybe mentally in particular, uh, that you addressed in very different ways. Is there something that stands out? I got a, uh, I could think of two. I'm trying to think of what would be more relevant. Um, do you have one, Shay? Or? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think I've told this story before, but I definitely had a moment, um, probably the most mentally like yeah. challenging part for me um, was uh, during mountain space and having like significant um, sleep deprivation issues and malnutrition issues and having a night where it was just particularly hard um, carrying the load and conceiving what the next missions would be and not knowing when, you know, the, the, the current mission you're on was going to be over. Um, the right. ranger instructors called it like a, a walk till dawn type, you know, scenario where we would just literally felt like meander in circles uh, until the light came up and then you were permitted to quickly eat your MREs, pass out for 30 minutes, which felt like days, but you were up in a second, you know, and, and back at it, um, which is just, it's, it's, just, it's a testament to like what your body and your mind can do. Um, but during this sure. particular, I was having a really hard time. I, I like literally physically and mentally felt like I was, I was like breaking down, like that I wasn't going to be able to like accomplish, you know, the mission and finish out the rock march that we were doing. Cause so I was just starting to overheat and, uh, my ears would become muffled um, and my mind was really getting away from me. And I just felt like definitely, I mean, we went through the heat of the summer. It was really, really hot. So they're quite, you know, daily, there was people, you know, we call it heat catting when they, when you get so sick that you get heat sickness and it just takes you out. And I know that that sure. it makes you delirious and all those things. And this one particular night, 
I really thought that like I was, I was left behind that I, I, I needed to catch up to my team, like to my platoon that I was with, um, that I was, I couldn't hear. And like, I, I started convincing myself, I couldn't see, like I was becoming blind because it was so dark and my, my nods were not working correctly. And so I just started like, like kind of like trotting. Cause I was like, Oh God, I need to catch up to the person in front of me. I don't know how you figure out where I am. I can't hear, I can't see. Um, and kind of like, like we were, we were finally finishing and I like see, I see somebody as our ranger instructor that's up there. And he's like, he's just kind of, he's like, ranger, ranger, I'm like, what are you doing? And I was like, I have to catch up to my, my platoon. He's just like, you're in front of any good, everybody stop, like stop what you're doing. And I'm like, I was so, but I was so out of it. I was so like beyond. And like, I just remember like the feeling of like relief because I just felt, I was like, surely like if I'm lost, I'm getting dropped. You know, I, if I, sure. if I'm blind and I can't hear anything, like if I'm literally heat catting, I'm going to get sent back to medical town. I'm going to get dropped. Like everything was, you're going to get dropped. It was just like this terrifying looming feeling if anything had happened to you that you couldn't control that like you were dropped, wow. you know, your chance would be gone. Um, and I just remember and that like, literally like, as I was like kind of trotting in this and I'm like, just trying to remember my why, like I told you about, and I just kept on sure. kind of I started naming my soldiers um, and just trying to tie anything to myself to the present moment. Um, right. and I, and I just started naming people's names and my, my parents, my siblings, my soldiers, um, my ranger buddies that I've become really close with. And I was like, they deserve for me to be here. Like they deserve for me to be here, you know, kind of thing. Um, right. and it got it got me to like, to the end, you know, and, and I didn't know that I was even at the end. It just, it ended and what a relief. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. I love that story, Shay. Yeah. Um, I think one of the ones I don't actually tell very often um, was like the difference that I saw from the first time we went through Darby phase to the third time. <laughs> Um, you know, I remember the first time we, you know, got a fake casualty, the guy goes down, they put him on the litter, um, they're carrying him, and then his rucksack was left over and it's like an, an extra 80 pounds. And it's like, who's going to carry this. And I just remember this ranger battalion guy, um, just picked it up, put it on his front and just continued to walk with it. And I was just so like grateful, like, <laughs> Cause otherwise that's like a huge holdup. I mean, what are you going to do? Drag it. I mean, and, uh, I was just like watching him and he was like six feet tall. And I was just like, thank God he's here. And I was like, do you need any help? And he was like, nah, I'm good. And I was like, thank God. Cause I don't know if I could help you. <laughs> and I was just like, man, that guy is like a ranger, you know? Um, I mean, cause he just continued to carry it for the rest of the mission without like breaking a sweat. And then, um, and that was something I thought, like, I was like, I could never, I can't do that. And, um, then come time for the third iteration, you know, we took a day one recycle. We started all over from the beginning. And I think like Shay said, we went into it with the attitude of like, okay, we can't just be trying to like get like survive here. We need to like thrive and like Excel and stand out if we really want to move on to the next phase. And, um, we had, had you guys talked about this, the two of you, not exactly. I don't think. Yeah. Really sorry to interrupt, but I mean, we had a three week holdover cause the instructors had like a, a leave period. Okay. So it was just kind of like, man, if we're going to, if we're going to go back and try to do this again, what are we going to do differently? You know, like, and, and you also had just gone through like two months of ranger school. So we were much more familiar with it and just more experienced. Yeah. Um, and so that was when I kind of realized like, I'm the veteran here of rangers of ranger school at this moment, even though these are all guys they were all brand new and we had a similar thing happen where we received a casualty, you know, all notional and the rucksack was there is the assistant gunner, which is like the heaviest rucksack with the heavy tripod and all this extra machine gun ammo. And, uh, you know, some guys were trying to carry it, like each carry a strap or something. And it was really struggling. And I was just like, I know what needs to be done here. <laughs> and I was able to just go over and pick it up and put it on my front and just carried it for the rest of the mission. Like, you know, another kilometer or two. And, sure. um, you know, the guys were coming up to me, like, can we help? And I was like, trust me, it's faster this way. And I just kept going. And, um, it just like seeing that, that change in like, Oh, it wasn't because I was a woman. Uh, it was because I wasn't experienced. I hadn't encountered this before and I hadn't tried it and I hadn't seen any 
I hadn't seen it done. And so it wasn't about my gender. It was just about like, oh, okay. You know, now I, now I have the experience. I've been here for two months. And actually I, I, it gave me some more confidence that like, I do know what I'm doing actually here versus right. the first, you know, the first time through, I felt like I was in basic training again, like not knowing anything. Um, so that was uh, a big moment for me, I guess. How, how did both of you, it seems like, and I know that it's part of Ranger School for almost everybody that goes through it to recycle once or, or more, uh, but how, does it, how did it feel and how did you get past, at least what I'm projecting, that would be incredibly difficult to get through you know, your second try and have them say, nope, that's not good enough. You got to go back and start over again for the third time. How do you, how do you get yourself out of what could be a like, you know, I'm, I'm just done. Well, that was actually a big struggle because the, the worst, you know, the worst situation was that they didn't tell us right away that we were going back for a third time. They told us we were getting sent home, you know, um, right. we had already, you know, five women before us had already been sent home and they all came out and were like, yeah, we're, we're just going home. And Shay and I both got told like, Hey, good, good try. You know, you did well, but you you didn't pass your patrols again. So you got to go. And, um, so I think it was like that fighting to stay there and like, sure. I think Shay was negotiating a bit to try to just move on to mountains if I remember, but I was like, you know, sir, I, I think I can stay. I think I can do it again. And kind of like Shay was talking about, like remembering your why, like at that point, all I wanted to do was go home. I just wanted to go sit in an air conditioned hotel room and like eat donuts And like, I just, or eat whatever, you know, I wanted to, I was like, I want to go to a grocery store. Like, I just felt so deprived of everything. And, um, I was like, I don't, you know, I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. But then I remembered like my, why, in addition to my soldiers, you know, my, my mentor had told me like, not only can you do this, but you, you should do it because your soldiers deserve you to be at your best. Um, but then I was also thinking of like eight year old me. And all the times I got told I couldn't do something because I was a girl, because I wanted to be a boy scout. I wanted to play baseball. I wanted to play football. I knew I wanted to be in the infantry. And uh, it was like, I just can't stand the idea of like, just continuing this, this trend and just allowing this to continue of like women getting told you can't even apply to this job. You can't even go to this school because you're a woman. Um, And that was enough to want to, you know, ask to be there and, uh, you know, really try to, to give me the like strength to stay really. I, that's wonderful. I love that idea of going back and remembering the eight-year-old you. It would probably do us all well to think of that once in a while. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And all the, all the women after me, you know, it's like, sure. All these other women are my soldiers that they deserve. They deserve the chance to get the best training the army has to offer before they get sent to a combat zone. You know, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd already been to Afghanistan at this point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I'd wanted the training before I went and it's like, why are we sending women to combat without giving them the same training as the men, you know? Sure. Yeah. So I don't want to jump ahead on Ranger school, but you both then went into the infantry as the first women to become infantry officers and then went into command as infantry officers. That, that seems like almost even a bigger deal than, than finishing ranger school. How, how did that feel to you similarly or? Uh, Real yeah. quick, Shannon. So uh, not differently, back okay. to your, the last question, not differently, but maybe separate. Um, sure. Kristen didn't find negotiation uh, to try to uh-huh. stay um, <laughs> in, in ranger school. But I will just say, uh, cause this does translate into my decision to go into the infantry, um, which I'll expand on, but um, be, because it wasn't something that I thought that I wanted to do. Um, right. but the reason, the reason that I gave myself permission to fight to stay, um, was originally not because I was fighting for myself at all, but my teammates were the squad that I was with my final squad when I was, um, on that, you know, my, my second iteration, um, of a Darby phase was, uh, a breath of fresh air. So the first time I went through, like, I became very close with my teammates, which was awesome. The second time through, like, we literally were a tribe. Um, And that made all the difference in the world. I knew for a fact that they were not, you know, going to sabotage me or, or, or they actually, they had my back. 
um, that when we, you know, there's, there's a saying that we say that you don't get your tab in, in ranger school, your, your ranger buddies get your tab for you because when it's your day to be a leader, everyone else is required to be a follower. And if they don't follow well, and, and if you don't lead well, okay. But like, but if they don't follow well and set you up for success and it's a team effort, they get you right. your tab. And I was very sure that that team was the team that I was supposed to go through ranger school. I was, I was certain, you know, they wanted me, I wanted them it, that we were a team, we were a family, we were a tribe. Um, and they were the ones on my behalf, you know, speaking, you know, speaking up to, I remember talking to our cadre, our company cadre, like, no, I'll give her a chance. Like she didn't do anything w- w- worse than anyone else. Like there are these things, you know, like there's, a, these are all the things that she did well. These are the things that, you know, and I was so taken aback. Like I was, I literally, I felt, I was so humbled by that. Um, because in the back of my mind, I'm questioning me like, man, what well, you know, do I deserve to be here? Um, and the fact that they were willing to like say those things to our instructors and say those things to me, I was like, okay, my why is deepened so much more, you know, like you've gained, you know, you've gained a, um, a loyalty also in me, um, uh, which is, which is right. really, important. so yeah. So when we got called up to go into, um, our board, um, that we're required to go to when you're kicked out of ranger school, everybody gets to go to a board, a fair trial, who knows, but you at least get to go to a board. <laughs> Um, and, and that board, I was like, well, I'm going to take my chance. And I remember them saying very like candidly that they thought that the reason why we should not recycle, um, was they didn't like, in the end, they're like, you know, all these back and forths or whatever. And I could tell they were getting exhausted by the fact that I was even still talking to them. Cause they're like, no, like, this is not how this works. It's not actually a negotiation. You're done. Um, you know, and their, and their comments were that, um, they didn't think that we could physically, um, recycle again and, and make it through. And I was like, I was like, okay, give me, give me a chance. What do you want me to do? Push-ups? I'll do push-ups right here. I will do my 49 push-ups right here. And like in my head, I remember it being, I'm just like, there's no way I could do 49 push-ups right now. But I did. And like with my camel back on, like stay right there, you know, I have the regimental commander and sergeant major. And I'm doing probably the ugliest 49 push-ups I've ever done, but I freaking wiggled out every single one trying to prove that like I can stay, like let me stay. They think I deserve to stay. My teammates think that I, you know, deserve to stay. I deserve to stay. Um, and I got up and they're like, Ranger, don't let me like tell you twice. It's like, go back. Like you'll, you'll get recycled or whatever. I was like, I'm not waiting. I, like ran out, you know, I was like, I'm taking it, you know, and I ran out. That's great. And we had, you know, we had the ability to stay. And like, and so like, that's what fueled me. I was like, the, like failure is not final. Did I fail? Yes, technically I failed, but that was not going to, like, there was, there was a chance. There was something, there was hope. Um, and I was going to every piece until they literally escorted me off. I was going to continue to like, to fight, to be able to stay. So I did, but it's that community. And it was the support that I received from my ranger buddies that ended up like, you know, essentially facilitating my transition into the infantry anyways. Um, I won't get into it because it is dramatic or silly or whatever, but I, I didn't feel the same type of camaraderie and support when I went back to my aviation unit, I had a hard time. Um, and I ended up to um, triple C actually the class right after Kristen and her decision to transfer into the infantry. So I knew it could be done. And I was really proud to be able to follow right after her um, into that. And I had to make a really deliberate decision. And it took all of going to the um, maneuver captain's uh, career course, which was branch qualification requirement for a captain to transfer into the infantry. Um, sure. And I remember taking that six, six months, essentially like to decide and make sure that I was sure. And I was like, I am sure that those people whoever they are, they may not like me right away, but like I can be value added to those teams. I know it. Um, right. And I want to challenge myself in those ways. And I care deeply for the people that I work with and that I'm going to be a part of and those units. And like, if they're willing to challenge themselves, I am too. And I really want that opportunity to, to go um, do something different and do sure. something different. And so, um, so that was, I mean, that, that story, Ranger school really was what propelled into, you know, going into the infantry and getting all these other experiences and, and being able to, um, people ask me all the time, like, do you miss flying? Like, yes, flying's fun. Like being an Apache pilot was awesome. Like that's so yeah. cool. I would never, I don't regret. And I never would give up the fact that I got to command three infantry companies and I had the most amazing leaders. I had some really crappy guys and some really awesome guys. And we developed and we grew and we cried and we whatever, you know, it's just, it's, it's human. It's human. Sure. All of it's human. And that's, what's important. Um, you can have really tough guys and you can have really soft guys. You can have all t- types of people uh, that contribute to what it is. It's the human organization that we have. It's the army. And I love it. 
I love every piece of it. That's amazing. And Chris, was, you must have no. just been like, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was like, oh, that wasn't a tear. That was an itchy guy, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Chris, you must have just been psyched, like when you when you realized that infantry was an option, and uh, was there any hesitation or? Uh, no, but there was some uncertainty because so we graduated in August of 2015, and I had to make a career decision by November. I was gonna, I was um, templated to go to a civil affairs selection, okay. which is kind of a special operations unit that. I was like, well, if I'm going to stay in the army, I want to go this direction. But it looked like the infantry was going to open up, but it it hadn't opened up yet by November 2015. So it was kind of on a whim uh, that I was like, oh, let me go down to the maneuver captain's career course, the infantry course Shay was talking about that qualifies you to be an infantry officer or armor officer um, or captain, sorry, not just officer. But um, I was like, I'm going to go put myself down there and just hope that the policy changes, which is kind of my thought process going into West Point. So I was like, hopefully it works this time because <laughs> now it was eight years, you know, since I joined. Um, right. So I was like, all right, let me go down there to Fort Benning and go through this course and make sure again, like I'm just as prepared as I can be if the opportunity is available. And then by January 1st of that year, I think they said, you know, women were going to be allowed um, into the course or into the infantry rather. So then I was stoked. Um, I was ready to go. I, I remember General Miller. Uh, he was a major general at the time, two-star. He was in charge of Fort Benning and he kind of did a big question and answer session, you know, came sure. and talked to the whole career course, which is, I don't know, maybe 200 or 300 people, Shay, I forget, but big auditorium, all men. I think there was three of us women there and, uh, you didn't have to go into the infantry. So they were other branches. Um, but he was like, you know, we were talking about Afghanistan, you know, other stuff, but he was like, all right, I know the elephant in the room. What do you guys feel about women in the infantry or how many of you are worried about it? And I was actually really surprised that like three quarters of the hands in the room went up. Um, not, not my friends, wow. but the guys that were in my small group, you know, that knew me and had worked with me for the last two months, but a lot of people were really worried about it. And, um, and then he just straight up was like, I'm not worried about it. Okay. Like I've served in special operations units. I've worked with women many times, like not only, you know, can they do this, but like we need them in these units. And so automatically we had that vote of confidence from a very highly respected two-star general uh, who became a four-star uh, and recently retired. But, you know, that made me feel like, okay, I do, I do belong here, even if, you know, there's some some concern and hesitation about it. And it just sort of prepared me that, okay, I'm going to be facing this, but you know, it is valid for me to be here. Um, so that kind of solid, I mean, I, I think I would have done it anyway. I know I would have sure. <laughs> because I wanted to forever, but that made me feel a lot better about the decision. And, uh, and then I also tried out for the best Ranger competition at the time. And um, I put my name on the list, like I signed up and, you know, in pencil on the wall. And I felt really kind of stupid about it. I was like, who do I think I am? Like applying for best ranger. I just graduated like three months ago. And I was like, I'm going to go erase my name. Like this is, I felt like I was being really presumptuous and like, they're going to, they're going to be like, who does she think she is? And then one of my friends who was a male captain there texted me. He was like, Hey, I saw your name on the list. I think that's awesome. Like way to go. And I didn't realize what it was at the time, but he was kind of like authorizing me to feel like, you know, oh, it's okay for me to do this. And, uh, I didn't realize how important that was to me. It just, but it really meant a lot to me to have that, you know, really respected infantry male captain, give me the vote of confidence that like, you know, welcome to the team, you know, for sure. So then I, by the time I graduated in May, I think, or April, I forget, um, of 2016, they let me transfer into the infantry and then Colonel Ralph Puckett was retired. Um, and he's actually, I believe the most decorated officer in the army now, because he re received the medal of honor recently and he had two silver stars <laughs> beforehand. Wow. Uh, he gave me my blue cord and, uh, that was really meaningful. So that's cool. That's the blue amazing. cord is the insignia. Like you get when you join the infantry. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, thank you for, 
the, the audience will not always know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> in, in fact, probably rarely. <laughs> That's great. So, and I know this is sort of jumping ahead and, and also, uh, and we want to make sure that um, we give enough time for each of these things, which is impossible because they're all hugely significant. But as you took your company commands, which is a really big thing. And I think it's hard for people to understand the level of responsibility that goes with a command and leading a military unit. Did you both deploy with your commands? I did not. I uh, switched yeah. out of commands and then I got to deploy, well, technically a second command, but it's only of 12 people uh, yeah. with a security force assistance brigade. Um, so that was a really cool deployment. It was a team of like 12 yeah. advisors and it was an infantry unit. But and, had, and where did you guys go? Where did you deploy? Uh, so we went to Afghanistan in 2019. Okay. So Shay and I overlapped in Afghanistan. Oh, you um, did? Yeah. But my team was, it was five of us in the infantry and then seven different uh, MOSs. So, you know, medical, fires, signal, engineer. So it was a really cool team, um, but not with my company. They deployed after I left. Okay. And, but that deployment with those 12 people, what was your mission? So we were tasked with advising an Afghan battalion um, in Afghanistan just to help secure, basically they were responsible for the Western side of Kabul. It's called Pogman province. It's kind of like a no man land, um, area that was pretty, um, hot with Taliban. And so we just advised them on security operations and really anything they needed help with. We, you know, their logistics, their medical training. Um, but our job was to advise the battalion staff. So I was partnered with the commander. My team sergeant was partnered with their sergeant major, and it wasn't going down to the platoons and teaching them how to shoot. It was teaching the commander and staff how to run the battalion, essentially. Sure. Yeah. Fantastic. And then, Shay, what were you doing at the same time when you overlapped? Yeah, so we got to overlap in Afghanistan um, for a period of time, um, and that was during my second company command, uh, and I was our headquarters and headquarters battalion um, uh, company commander. And um, Low, not, you know, unbeknownst to me when I took the job that it would be the most dynamic, you know, of the company commands um, for sure uh, during that time, just the time period in Afghanistan and the requirements and the support requirements. Um, as an agency commander, I was responsible for all of the medics and the mortars of my battalion that were spread out um, throughout Afghanistan, literally in every province. Um, with special forces units. Um, and so they would go, um, we would help occupy space and land for them um, where I got to be a ground force commander um, and uh, essentially assist and um, with, with medical personnel, which are, you can never have enough um, and then fire support um, for the special forces as they went out with the Afghan teams and advisory roles, um, which, was, which was super important. Um, and it just, it, it was such a, um, I guess a blessing in disguise to be able to experience the infantry in that way. Um, and, and not with my original company, which I was really sad to not deploy with them, but, um, they did such good work and being a part of their train up, um, and being a part of that group, um, getting ready for deployment was awesome. So to even, to be able to go to see, you know, them do so well, and then to be able to support my unit in the way that I did, um, was, was an exceptional experience really. Did either or both of you have, do you have something that stands out as a particular um, circumstance that was either trying or memorable in some way while you were deployed? Um, I feel like there was a lot of, you know, small things. Um, I don't know, I think I have to think about a little bit more about, you know, what I'd sure. want to talk about, I guess. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I think the probably the most memorable time, like while I was deployed, was having the opportunity to go out and and to be a ground force commander with a team that I got to select to go and kind of bolster the security of um, a specific spot um, and to help um, maintain um, a presence uh, in a place that significantly needed that at the time. Um, and you know, being out there with my team, kind of feeling you know alone and unafraid, and having you know. Um, the, the mission and the support um, from the battalion uh, to go out there and to do that and kind of, you know, this is your problem set and figure, you know, figure it out and having the ability to select the team to do that. Um, it just, it, it reminds you of like the extreme responsibility that we put sure. soldiers um, specifically, you know, in, um, in those environments. Um, it reminds you that um, 
especially while we were still in Afghanistan, that people were still in harm's way and they were still, you know, de defending the, the ideas of the reasons that we were there. Um, because a lot of our soldiers felt like they were deploying um, to, you know, not necessarily do the, the work that their predecessors, you know, had done and the work that potentially why they thought that they were joining the military. But it was, it was really important for them to see that what they were doing was important. Um, so that was a significant time that everybody coming together um, to put the pieces together to um, be able to uh, care for and uh, and uh, that that area the the support the teams that were out there, but also sure. to, be able to to sustain ourselves was important. Um, we had a significant scenario of an individual being like mortally wounded, to be honest, um, that had to come through our uh, base and. It was so amazing wow. to see everybody come together to donate blood, um, to be able to get the medevac going like quickly and across Afghanistan, which is not little, um, and, and to be able sure. to lose people in enough time to, to save that person's um, life. And I just remember, you know, not by any one person's actions, but all of our actions like coming together and being able like to this day, that person, you know, was able to survive. It was just, it was one of those moments that's like super surreal. And like, you're just, you're, you look like you're, you're, it feels like you're looking from the outside in um, and you're just, you're so proud of everybody that was involved um, and that everybody came together to, to, to do that one thing. And in that moment, the, the most important thing was that human being. Um, right. It's very, very cool. Well, definitely have that with me for the rest of my life. And when you went out as ground force commander, does how many people are with you? And, and does that mean that you leave the base and you're in a no. convoy or what, what's the, what does that no. look like? In the last several years of Afghanistan, like no conventional forces are out doing that type of thing uh, for yeah. sure. Um, so what, what that looked like was support operations, base operations, security internally, sure. um, and then providing fire support, which mostly is, um, uh, defensive type fires, not offensive type fires, but um, sure. in support of our Afghan partners. Um, right. The Afghan partners request, we send it up our chain of command and we support at every possible way that we can. Um, right. The biggest support is the medical support um, that we can provide right. because that is not a capability that they really have on their own. Um, and you can, you just, I mean, you know, think about in the United States, you can never have enough healthcare professionals, right? right so right, those for sure. capabilities yeah. at the right place at the right time um, was very, very important. So being able, being yeah. part of that thing, where they are, where they go, um, at what times, how they can augment and support um, was really, really good. And both of you are there as, as women commanders in the infantry, in both the military culture, but also a social culture that would not have been as permissive, I would think. How, how did that work? Actually, I mean, Chris, yeah, Chris, I would totally want to hear your story, but like, I was almost embarrassed by the number of times that like foreign leaders would come around and be like, like, look at her, look, she has a ranger, look at all this, like, oh, she's like, this is the commander, talk to her, you know, all this stuff, and I'd just be like, wait, 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 like, it, it, because it was unreal to them, like, they didn't, it, like, it, they had never seen it before, so you were kind of like a unicorn, <laughs> like, that's ridiculous. sure. <laughs> yeah, actually, I just remembered, I actually didn't wear my Ranger tab um, for a lot of my deployment because when we were going out, I didn't want anything like to super identify me or make me stand out any more than being a woman. And sure. they, they are familiar with like the Ranger tab or certain unit patches and stuff. So I was like, I don't need them knowing anything more about me. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> you know, when we went out to the different Afghan like outposts. So that was one incident I think that really stood out and hit me the hardest was, um, you know, one part of our job was to go out to these kind of remote combat outposts and look at their structures and really just evaluate and give them guidance on how to improve it so that their soldiers, one can actually stay there and live there and don't sure. go AWOL. You know, it's like they need living quarters of some kind and they need actual protection. And so we would basically do an assessment of their outposts and then go try to find um, contractors, you know, Afghan contractors that could actually go out there and install some, you know, like a gate or fortify their sure. towers or give them a kitchen and a latrine, stuff like that, mm -hmm. just so that the soldiers ha have protection. Um, so that was a big part of our job for the first half of the deployment. And then um, unfortunately, 
you know, two soldiers from the 82nd, um, two privates were unfortunately killed on that type of operation because they're up in a guard post. So, you know, when you go to their base, um, our soldiers would suddenly start guarding instead of the Afghans, you know, pulling okay. security for the base. You know, our soldiers would go up there. We had an infantry National Guard squad attached and they would take over the security of the base for us. Um, and that's essentially what these two infantry privates were doing. And um, it was a green on blue attack when somebody who's been radicalized in the Afghan forces turns on the American advisors. So, wow. you know, that was just a really tragic event um, and really hit home because it was our, from our brigade that was out there. So my co- it wasn't for my company, thankfully, but, you know, it still felt like our team and our family. Um, right. They were, they were brand new. It was their first deployment. And so that, you know, made us all kind of retract. We all had to like, they, they put a lot more um, strict policies on. We could no longer do that mission because um, it was just, it was just such a high risk at the end of the, at essentially the end of the war in 2019. And it was like, all right, you now now you need to advise, you know, you can walk over to their base because it was close to us, but we couldn't go out to these combat um, outposts anymore because it was just too remote. And, um, you know, trying to work through that with our advisors and not have them feel like we were abandoning them, but also making right. sure we were taking care of our guys. Cause you know, the infantry squad attached to me, they were like 20 year old guys too. And right. the difference between my deployment when I was 24 and 30, like yeah. when I was 24, I was like, let's go, let's get into some stuff. Let's see what's out there. Um, versus when I was 30, I felt like I was much more like, let's make sure everybody comes home. Um, and of course I felt that way the first time too, but everybody was much more amped up in 2013. I felt like versus in 2019, it was like, let's make sure Interesting. everybody's, you know, very well taken care of here and we're not taking right. unnecessary risks for any reason. There's good wisdom in that experience, obviously. Mm-hmm. Wonderful to bear. Yeah. Well, if either, if, if you were talking to somebody who was coming up against something that, I mean, I think you've answered this already for yourselves and how you addressed your, your own challenges early on and, and throughout, but um, what would you say to somebody, not necessarily military, but, but facing some kind of um, feeling like they're, they're not welcome, that they're not sort of uh, allowed in a given circumstance and, and yet really wanting to move in a particular direction, what would you suggest? Um, I think, you know, the biggest thing for me, and it was one of like the biggest personal development things in my life, I think was going through what we, what we went through after we graduated Ranger school, which was a lot of backlash, um, from, you know, some, some of the veteran community, I think online, you know, most of it, most of it was online, I would say. Um, but it gets back to you and you hear people repeating it and you hear people talking about it and, um, you know, people doubting whether or not, you know, actually asserting that they must have lowered the standards and they know for a fact yes. that, you know, some like our rucksacks were carried by somebody else. And you just, you know, witnessing people like printing lies about you and just writing right. it like it's fact and spreading rumors. Um, it, it just made me realize like, you know, I, I actually exist like completely independent of like what people say about me. And it's mm. like, you know, I know what I went through and I know how that changed me. And like, nothing's going to affect that. You can't take that away from me. Like that right? completely changed who I am going through that four months of ranger school and the train up leading to it. Um, and so, you know, that's the advice I would give people is like, people are gonna criticize you no matter what you do. In fact, like, you know, I think the more significant activities you take on, you're probably going to get more criticism. So Right. Just know that going into it and accept it and uh, know that it doesn't matter at all. And it doesn't impact you or change who you are unless you let it really. And uh, I think there was probably a small period of time where I was like letting it really affect me mentally and emotionally. And then I just had to be like, this is ridiculous. You know, like I know what I did and I don't need to, to even consider or read any of these comments or or take this into consideration at all, you know? Sure. That's, and that can be a really hard thing to do. Yeah. It took a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shay, what about yeah. you? Yeah. I'd say the, the other aspect of it is um, not feeling like you have to do it by yourself. So 
Um, sure. Even if you are a first, even even if you are, you know, going through something um, at, that looks like you look different or you feel different um, or you think that you're different. Um, I think that it's dangerous when you isolate yourself, um, mm -hmm. when you don't share that experience with other people. And like I expressed, you know, earlier in this, that um, it's far more impactful and meaningful if it is a team effort. And then when there's other people championing you on your behalf. So it's behoove you to um, be open um, upfront about your intentions of what you're doing, to share what it is that you love about what you're doing so that other people don't have really the room to misinterpret um, or interpret in the way that they want to, um, what your intentions are. And honestly, it doesn't matter what the intentions are. It's just the fact that they're communicated. Um, right. I've, I've gotten a lot of, you know, questions like, oh, are you worried about, in general, like this day and age, like, is it, wouldn't it be so crazy, you know, like the next generations, like all the stuff you can find about them online and all this. And you're like, you know what? Yeah, it is scary. And you could look, you could look at it at, you know, that perspective, but the, but the, but I think what is the bigger person or what is the bigger way is to own that stuff up front um, sure. to, to, to say, yes, I've made these mistakes or yes, my intentions are X and I need that to be fully known. Um, and it's not, if it's not acceptable, people are going to find out if you're having a really hard time. Sometimes it is because you don't have the right intentions behind what you're doing. And oh, by the way, like just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean that you should, maybe you do need yes. more training. Again, we recycled and had to do derby phase three times. We weren't ready. Right. Right. We were not, um, we got the opportunity because we persisted. Um, and we did not persist on our own means and demanding that we had a seat at the table. We were allowed a seat at the table. And then we took advantage of that opportunity yeah. by performing um, to the best of our abilities and always making it about other people and not necessarily sure. ourselves and the advancement of ourselves. Um, is there benefit to yourself? Yes, there are absolutely like what, you know, the, you, you have to have some self pride and self dignity and, and want to um, develop yourself that those things can be understood by any person, man, woman. Um, sure. But I think it's the transparency that counts the most. And I will tell you, that is the hardest part. That is the hardest part. Everybody wants to be known for the things that they shine at. They don't want to be known for the things that, you know, aren't acceptable or the things that, you know, you know, all the failures or what all, you know, I think I've heard it most recently say like, nobody wants um, all of like what it took to become, you know, to be known. Right. That's all part right. of the Like all that is so very, very important as well. And to be honest, right. like, I feel like if you wanted, you know, Kristen, you know, talked about like, I, I kept myself no social media over here. So, you know, I kept myself very you know, distanced from a lot of that stuff, but I'm glad that he did. Cause it really was protective yeah. of my, but I feel like people would have a whole lot harder of a time. And they did like all the people that wanted to talk bad about us or say different things or whatever online they did. Guess what they didn't do. They didn't say it to our faces because you know what, that would have probably yes. caused you to have a conversation and know yep. the truth to have a, to, to ask a question that they didn't want to ask. They just wanted to assume and they were injured or hurt by something. And I honestly would love to hear what that is. Why does it hurt so bad that, that you know, that a woman's in that space? If you, yes. think, if you assume, if you're assuming it's for a really bad reason, like, why don't you give me the opportunity to tell you what my reason is? Could there be women right. out there with bad reasons? Sure. But I don't think that mine was. And do you want to hear mine? Doesn't sound like you do, you know? So that's the difference. Right. Every person is an yeah. individual. If a woman is occupying a space, like I, I would want to, you know, just like any leader, I would want to get to know them. Um, I would want, you know, to know what their capabilities are. There are some organizations that are a lot more cutthroat and you do have to prove yourself a lot more in, in, in certain, you know, industry or whatever it is, sure. you know, one of those industries. Um, and that's okay. I think, I think that it's okay to have a high standard and require that everybody like raises to that thing. Um, For sure. But I don't think that you have to do it alone. I don't think that you have to do it despite or in spite of. Um, whenever I have these opportunities, the reason why I say opportunities, because I'm legitimately grateful. I'm not resentful yeah. of all of the time that the things that, you know, I was not allowed to do growing up or that I didn't get the opportunity until a certain, you know, point or whatever. I'm so grateful for all the people who, you know, dealt with the crap before me yeah. so that I sure. didn't have to, because I didn't necessarily have to deal with that. I had to individual, you know, individually, I had my challenges, sure. um, some, you know, some of which I'm, I'm sure were fueled by like, you know, I don't, you know, could this be a gender issue? Maybe, but really I think yeah. it's a personality issue and it's a one-on-one -on -one issue and it's a, and it's a coming to realize there's a lot, leadership is hard period. And you don't get right. along 
absolutely everyone. And personality differences definitely do matter in a human environment and hu- human dy- dynamics and um, yeah. maturity matters and growing matters and you're not going to get it right every single time. Um, so I, I would just say like, sure. there's, there's a level of humility um, that you have to walk into and a level of like acceptance that like when you're new, it may not be like different for you, but it could be different for someone else. And like, be respectful of that space too. Sure. I have one last question. And this actually came up in another interview um, uh, off the record for somebody, uh, but this person got to a very high level of achievement in a space where she was, um, you know, one of the only ones and, um, and realized at this very high level that she didn't love it. Like she'd gotten here, like she'd, she'd proven it right in a sense, but she didn't love it. Um, and I thought that was really probably more common than we recognize and a little bit sad. Uh, I think she's, she's coming to terms with that. And this will not be part of the podcast piece because that's her, her, her journey. That's not a public one, but wh- what do you think about, um, what do you think about doing the work and then being able to continue to assess like, hey, you've gotten to this place. And it sounds to me like you both have really loved the experience and love the people that you're with. What if you get to this incredibly challenging peak and realize that's not the right place to be? So I think, you know, the interesting thing to me is I really have loved every job I've had in the infantry, uh, but I still feel like I can do better or I hope I can do better and I want to improve. Um, So I don't feel like I necessarily need to go be a battalion, an infantry battalion commander. And that's seen as the pinnacle or kind of like successful career, 20 year career, um, right. Lieutenant Colonel commanding 600 infantry soldiers. Um, and I would, I would like to, I want that opportunity, but right now I'm like, I, feel like I want to see some improvement in myself um, yeah. before I feel like, oh, I need to just get that job because that's on the list of jobs to get. It's, right. it's like, do I feel like I'm um, developing as a leader as uh, the way I want to be? Am I actually going to be value added to an infantry battalion? Am I going to be what the army needs me to be to lead that many soldiers? Because right. it's it's competitive at that level. And I feel I feel like I need to see that progression in, in myself. Um, and I think I saw it from certainly from platoon leader to company commander. And then even, I think I got better as a, uh, team leader, but there are still certainly things that I I wish I could go back and just do differently and have another command. And so that's kind of what led me to the job I'm about to embark on. Um, I'm in graduate school for a degree in organizational psychology, which is, you know, really the psychology of team performance and leadership. Sure. Um, and then I'm going to get to go to West Point and hopefully apply what I've learned both in my career and now academically to lead a company of about 120 cadets. And uh, that's where I really want to like put into practice and and see like, OK, have I have I learned a lot and am I able to apply the lessons I've learned and make this company run the way I wish I had done, you know, six years ago when I first ran a company. Right. Um, so. Yeah, I kind of take every job as it comes and I'm I'm just grateful for them. Every every job, you know, really in the army that I've had has been great one way or the other, even if I didn't feel that way going into it sometimes, like staff position. Sure. Um, I just look for like what can I learn here and how can I improve and how can I be what my soldiers need me to be? And if I don't feel like I'm there, you know, I'm I'm fine being like, hey, maybe this isn't the right fit. There's plenty of other things I, I'm interested in. And could right. pursue, but I do want to give this, you know, continue going down this road of getting better at leadership. I think. Great. Yeah. 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 The other thought, Shay, or. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I think I no. I think that the question that you posed is, is interesting um, because I think that um, when you start your career, like you're obligated to time, and right. so. There's a, there's a definitive amount of time and there are jobs that are, are normal, you know, during that time you, that you compete for and um, that you, you, you perform in and you hope that that will translate into future potential um, right. to continue on and to lead, you know, soldiers. 
I think that every officer, um, maybe that's the wrong thing to say, but I think that every officer knows that the army defines success as what Kristen described, you know, battalion commander, 20 years, right. you know, and leave. I don't think that it is appropriate for everyone to have that career path. Um, it just right. doesn't make sense. And the army doesn't think that makes sense either, or else it wouldn't be competitive A or B, our units would be completely, you know, structured differently. So more people would have the opportunity. Sure. Um, so I like what Kristen said about knowing yourself and knowing where you're at um, to, to kind of select yourself or the jobs that you want to do to improve and to head like in that direction. And I think that that's, um, I, I think that that's, I think that's the right way to approach it and look at it. And like I'm becoming, right. I'm, I'm working towards that thing. Um, sure. But I also think that it's absolutely okay to step away from something if it's not, you know, and choose something that is more along your path um, that maybe even that interests you more. Um, mm -hmm for, you know, for, for the sake of learning, um, for the faith that for the sake of fulfilling your own personal potential, uh, and continue to, to give back the idea that like, yeah. you're going to be able to influence and impact people at a greater, you know, greater scale and greater, if you are operating in your optimal, you know, uh, existence. Um, I think that really matters. I think that it's important sure. to challenge yourself and to push yourself. I also think it's okay that when you get to a point, you're like, I found what I really like. And it's not this thing or this path that other people think it might be. Um, I, I, I think it's really important to notice when that happens. Um, people, some people, you know, don't, don't, they, they follow the path and like that, that's totally fine. And that's, that's what they need to do. Um, but I will tell you, like all of us eventually take the uniform off. And I, right. I, I want to be someone that no matter when that point is, that like, I don't have any regrets of not, you know, pursuing something because I thought it was going to be too challenging and too hard, but it was a deliberate decision for me to choose to do something else or something yes. that I love, um, or, or to move, you know, on in the right direction. So, um, Chris and I both are at like a really like great point in our career to be making like this, these very, you know, specific assessments that you're talking about right now of what it is that we want to continue to do and serve and, um, to contribute and give back. Um, and, and I think that that's good. That could, you know, that could very well be in the army for the next 20, you know, for the next sure. how years, um, or that could be, um, and some other capacity. And I think that both of us are, um, I guess, accepting of ourselves that whatever that is, like that it's okay, that it doesn't have to meet somebody else's expectation. We recognize that it absolutely needs to be fulfilling for us too, because that's the only space we're going to be able to make the best, you know, choices, the, the biggest difference. Um, of and course. Yeah. Well, I love hearing you say that you, you need to know yourself, need to know what it is that, that is really driving you. And that's the best way that we can contribute in the world, right? Is to be aware enough to be able to make those decisions so thoughtfully. So thank you guys both for sharing your stories and, and your perspectives. You're amazing. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Shannon. Haver and Greist changed history. And in doing so, they set the stage for leaders to follow. In March 2022, the 100th woman graduated from Ranger School. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. And to keep the episodes coming, head on over to Patreon and join me at the link below. Meanwhile, be sure to pick up your own copy of The Grit Factor, Courage, Resilience, and Leadership in the Most Male-Dominated Organization in the World, and check out thegritinstitute.com for learning journeys in grit and purpose. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time on The Grit Factor.